Hello everyone, I'm Mike Waterworth. This is my literature review presentation on rotation plasty. It's a surgical alternative to above knee amputations. Rotation plasty is a surgical procedure for salvaging the bottom portion of a limb when the midsection must be removed. The procedure is a combination of resecting the limb near the midsection and autografting the distal segment back onto the proximal segment with 180 degrees of rotation. This allows the joint to function similar to the removed joint. Rotation plasty is commonly used to preserve the limb of skeletally immature individuals affected by sarcomas in the knee joint. The resection generally occurs at the distal femur or proximal tibia. A distal femur resection is a type A1 and a proximal tibia resection is type A2. The selection of where to resect is based on the location of the sarcoma. It can also be used in cases with congenital deformities and femoral length. There are other types of rotation plasty, but my presentation mostly focuses on type A, which is when the ankle joint is functioning as a new knee joint. There's also type B rotation plasty, which is where the knee joint functions as a new hip joint, while the ankle simultaneously functions as the new knee joint. This, however, introduces much more complicated biomechanical implications. However, there is much less literature available for this type, and as such, I excluded this type of rotation plasty from my review. For those interested, here is the actual process of a rotation plasty. Take a while to look at the images. Rotation plasty offers many advantages over conventional above knee amputation and limb salvaging methods, the most significant of which is having a functioning knee joint despite undergoing an above knee amputation. This allows active sports participation and easy fitting of prostheses, as well as few additional surgeries throughout life to maintain functionality. There are many biomechanical considerations that need to be reviewed when it comes to type A rotation plasties, namely the effects of rotation plasty on gait patterns and prosthesis loading patterns to determine whether it is still a strong surgical option for sarcomas of the leg. The largest concern of someone requiring amputation of their lower limb is their ability to ambulate or walk. Fuchs and colleagues, Murray and colleagues, and Benedatti and colleagues found that during the gait cycle, the range of motion of an individual with a rotation plasty stays within normal ranges. The gait pattern of the rotation plasty is also similar to that of normal individuals with minor differentiation. These three studies use differing methods for joint angle measurements. Fuchs and colleagues used an eight camera system with reflective markers using the Vicon Nexus software, whereas Murray and colleagues utilized a series of photographs with manual joint angle measurements. Despite their differences in methodology, the studies all found similar results. This is interesting, as it shows that, that despite Murray and colleagues' study being based on photographic analyses, it was still valid, as the results of the Benedetti study and the Fuchs study used the current industry standard for movement analysis and produced similar results. One general finding regarding the hip was that the rotation plasty patients experienced slightly higher pelvic tilt in the interior direction. This compensation generally results in increased hip flexion angles. As for knee motion, individuals with a rotation plasty do not straighten the leg as much during the stance phase of gait. This could be due to a lack of strength to support the body when the knee is near neutral, as the new knee joint has more strength while maintaining flexion. Otherwise, knee flexion was normal during gait, including the swing phase. This demonstrates that the prosthetic's limb ground clearance is a non-issue. This also indicates that in most cases, no altered vaulting gait is required in order to gain foot clearance, unlike traditional above knee amputees. As for the prosthetic ankle joint, the range of motion was slightly diminished from that of the normal population during the heel strike and initial contact phases of gait. However, this decrease in range of motion was due to the prosthetic ankle joint being equipped with a single axis cushion heel foot or sack foot. If a single axis foot was used instead of the sac foot on the participant's prostheses, the ankle may have better replicated normal dorsiflexion and plantar flexion ranges during the gait cycle. Walking speed was found to be slightly slower than normal populations in Fuchs and colleagues study. However, in direct opposition, Murray and colleagues found no significant differences in walking speed. One reason this could be is that Fuchs and colleagues were comparing their sample population of children to a normal population of adults, which isn't quite so valid, whereas Murray and colleagues compared their children population to a mean population of children, which is much more valid. 
Therefore, the walking speed of children with rotation plasty can be concluded to be similar to the walking speed of normal children. Murray and colleagues also assessed running with rotation plasty. They found that the angle of knee flexion was significantly less than that of normal running. This limitation in knee flexion range was thought to be due to the large increase in extension required of the new knee joint, which is comprised of the old ankle. Despite this, the individuals did display double leg floats while running, which are very similar to original running mechanics, although they did occur at a lower speed. As for walking on stairs, patients with a rotation plasty had no difficulty matching the speed and ranges of motion of the normal population, whereas typical above knee amputees require significant changes in the gait pattern to do so. The evidence is conclusive that a rotation plasty enables amputees to experience similar gait patterns to that of a normal person, particularly more so than traditional above knee amputees. This is further supported by the fact that rotation plasty also requires significantly less aerobic demand to walk than a traditional above knee amputation. However, these studies are a relatively small sample size, and they may not be generalizable to all recipients of a rotation plasty. As aforementioned, a prosthesis is attached to the new knee joint via wrapping around the foot, as can seen in the picture on the right. This provides strong ability for sports participation and a high level activity. However, if this activity ever is limited, it isn't due to a lack of functionality, but more so due to an inability of the foot to tolerate the load, resulting in pain. Since this inability to tolerate the load existed, Hillman, Rosenbaum, and Winkelman conducted a study investigating the load placed on the foot by the prosthesis by installing pressure-sensitive pads within the socket of the prosthesis. They ensured that all participants had used their prosthesis for several months to eliminate any fitting problems and the walking pace was self-selected to get an accurate representation of daily walking forces. The pressuring measuring insoles did not alter the fit of the prosthesis in the opinion of the participants. The load was found to be carried on the plantar and dor dorsal aspects of the foot with no significant differences found between the two on average. However, the peak plantar force was significantly larger than the peak dorsal force while being loaded for much less time than the dorsal forces. The rotated foot was found to experience similar levels of force as the opposite non-rotated foot, but the force was distributed over smaller surface areas, particularly on the dorsal side, explaining the development of pressure calluses over the tarsal metatarsal joint in patients with a rotation plasty. This location of callus buildup is commonly reported in other rotation plasty studies. Hillman, Rosenbaum, and colleagues were able to alter the prostheses and more evenly distribute the pressure points in a future study. Using the pressure-sensitive insoles could prove useful for the identification of areas experiencing pressure to, to prevent the development of pre severe pressure sores. As pressure sores are commonly reported in all prostheses wearing individuals, not just those with rotation plasties. With all these forces being applied to the foot, Benedetti and colleagues wanted to conduct a study to examine how the foot adapted to all these forces. Using radiography, Benedetti examined changes in the joint space and bone density. They also measured gait patterns, foot length, thigh length, ranges of motion of the foot, and they also did this while looking at maximal ground reaction forces and gait parameters. They also used an eight camera Vicon Nexus system and two force plates. The gait results were identical to those in both Murray and colleagues study and Fuchs and colleagues studies. However, the radiography showed something very interesting. If we look at uh, photo A here, we can see narrower joint spaces, smaller bone sizes, and plantar flex toes. The bones also appeared weaker in the radiography of the rotated foot compared to the non-rotated foot, and we can see this by the brightness of the contrast to look at bone density. Uh, smaller foot size has been reported in various other studies as well, and it's often more severe the younger the age that the rotation plasty is actually performed. Skeletally immature individuals have rotation plasty as a viable substitute to above knee amputations. Near normal gait patterns are often developed despite the procedure. This allows participation in sports and recre recreational activities. Uh, further studies should be conducted with larger sample sizes as the current literature is limited by the number of rotation plasties being performed, as well as the high dropout rate due to cancer reappearing in the body elsewhere. This would offer more support towards the high functional ability that seems to be so apparent in the literature. We should utilize this prosthesis loading pattern as we can make the comfort level of prostheses much higher for all wearers, not just those with rotation plasties. If you have any questions about my presentation or rotation policies in general, contact me at my student email below. Thank you.